I never really felt a connection with my father's parents, Carl and Johanna. He, I remember as patient and kind and she, my grandmother, as austere, practical and distant. He emigrated from Germany in the late 1800s, destined for Ireland. She had grown up on a small tenant farm in Kilmacow in South Kilkenny. We didn't see enough of them to form a close bond. I was six when he died, 11 when she followed, and they and their story were pushed into my subconscious, floating there and surfacing now and again in response to some memory or random event. And it was exactly that, a random event in 2014, that brought them abruptly to the surface. Over breakfast on a Sunday morning while visiting friends in Old Castle in County Meath, I mentioned in passing that my grandfather had been interned by the British in the internment camp in Old Castle during the First World War. This hung on the air for a moment and then the you're kidding and the that is amazing responses came. My friends wanted to know the story, but I didn't know much of the story. In fact, I knew only the bare bones. This was never a topic of conversation in the wider family, and now I get that. What happened to my father's family in 1914 was so traumatic and cataclysmic that when the family came back the, out the other side, it was probably easier to just move on with their lives. The community around Oldcastle, though, had no such ambivalence about this piece of their town's history. They had worked over years creating an archive to honour the memory and suffering of these hundreds of men from all over Ireland who were interned in the camp in their town during that war. The bare bones I knew consisted of a few scraps of information. I knew that my grandfather was woken by British soldiers and taken from his home without warning. A, far, a telegram delivered the next day with his whereabouts. I imagined the panic. I imagined children crying in terror. My grandmother helping to get things together that he might need, having no idea about how long he might be away. Him with no option but to leave his family and comply. I imagine the sense of shock in the silence after the door closed behind him. He was a German national living and working in Ireland and viewed by the British as a foreign alien who posed a potential threat at the start of World War I. The camp he was taken to in Old Castle accommodated 600 plus internees, most from Germany, a few from Austria and Hungary. He was away from his family for five years, being transferred from Old Castle in 1918, when for security reasons, the British closed the camp, moving all internees to Nakaloo on the Isle of Man, now acknowledged as one of the cruelest internment camps in the British Isles. In late 2014, my friends contacted me about an event planned by the community in Oldcastle. It was taking place to commemorate the arrival of the first internees 100 years earlier and was planned for Sunday the 14th of December at two o'clock. The meeting point was the old railway station. I had no idea what to expect, but the draw was strong enough and going was a no-brainer. On arrival in Oldcastle and seeing the number of parked cars, it dawned on me that this was not a minor event. We joined the stream of people walking towards the meeting point up an unused road to the old, rail old railway station and onto what felt like a film set. Scattered throughout the gathering crowd were people dressed in the garb of 1914, a British army officer on horseback, four squaddies present with what I hope were replica guns, a donkey and cart at the front door of the original railway station and an old van playing German brass band music through a loudspeaker. I stood waiting in the cold for whatever was planned and felt as I stood there a sense of solemnity, of gravity, of respect among the gathering of strangers. At two o'clock precisely to the holler command of the army officer, a group of male civilians dressed in suits, hats, big gabardine coats and scarves emerged from the station, nudged along by the soldiers towards the cart where they deposited their battered suitcases. The soldiers stepped up, marshalling the group of internees behind the cart as the slow procession departed the station. I, along with all of these other people followed, it was a cold, quiet winter afternoon. And as I walked literally in his footstep, I began really for the first time ever to absorb the hugeness of this event in my grandfather's life. 
He had left behind his four children and his wife. He'd been the only breadwinner and the thoughts and feelings he must have experienced are difficult to imagine. I worked out as we walked that when he walked along this same road in 1914, there were no houses between the railway station and the town proper through which the procession passed, moving onward to the site of the camp. We came to a stop in a green surrounded now by houses where a local historian pointed out the boundaries of the camp, the locations of the six watchtowers. He told of an attorney shot dead while trying to escape. And as I stood and listened to his vivid description of life in the camp, I felt the spectre of my grandfather emerge more and more strongly. The final set piece of the day happened in a large hall above the library where I and a couple of hundred people squeezed into the space. The walls reflecting back to us the men and their lives filled with press cuttings and paintings and photographs and letters. Their ghosts surrounded us. Male voice choirs have a knack of tapping into an emotional vein, I think. And so when the choir from Navan began their version of Silent Night in German, remaining in any way emotionally disconnected was impossible. Tears flowed down every face it seemed, including mine. The choir's learned repertoire for the day of German Christmas carols interspersed the proceedings that varied from readings of some of the saddest and most wretched letters to and from internees to correspondence from the British archives and the management of the camp and key decisions taken. The hard, cold facts told of the misery, the loneliness, the feelings of injustice and despair, of loss, of physical hardship. The event was coming to an end when there was an invitation for the relatives of any of the internees to say a few words if they'd like. It never occurred to me to include myself in that number. Strange, I know, but true. And as several people walked to the head of the room and bore witness to their relative, Dermid, my partner, nudged me, and my old castle friends indicated with a forward nod of their heads that I should say something. I froze, my heart drumming, panic setting in, and when it seemed that the last person had spoken, I literally found myself on my feet, propelled, propelled forward and then turning to look at the room full of expectant faces. I opened my mouth to speak, having no notion of what was going to emerge. I said, I recall that I wanted to name my grandfather here on this day, and I stated his name, Karl Ullemann. Will you know that sensation when you feel tears welling up and when a loud internal voice shouts, don't, but it did no good, I couldn't stop, the tears came. And so through them, I told that my father was 10 months old, the youngest of four children when Carl was removed from his life and that he didn't see his father again for five more years. I told that Carl had come back home in 1919 and that he went on to live a good life. Strangely, like many of the internees, his skill, skills as a chef were what brought him to Ireland. And so I told that he had become a renowned and recognized chef and that he was a prolific painter exhibiting in the RHA for 35 years on the trot. I do believe that his painting helped him in some way to survive the ordeal. I have a small and lovely little painting he did of a gaggle of geese in Nakaloo, and my sister has one of his bed in Old Castle, both painted on bits of wood for a canvas. But what stays with me most strongly from that day was that, that as the event was winding down, total strangers came to shake my hand. They seemed drawn to connect with someone who had a connection with one of the internees, their eyes saying what words could not convey. And then a woman approached, perhaps 15 or 20 years older than me, weeping as she leaned to hug me tightly. I don't know who she was. I will never meet her again. And I have since wondered about her and her story in relation to the camp. In that moment though, as she continued to hold me tightly and weep, the depth of that emotional connection to the camp, both of us for our own reasons, seemed utterly fathomless. Oh, Miriam, uh, I am gonna say what you're, when I read that story, I, had, I said to myself, what your friend said to me, that is amazing. I did not know anything about that history whatsoever. Um, no. Staggering. I, I mean, of course, I mean, I knew 
Germans were interned in Britain, and of course, then of course, naturally that would extend here. But I just have never heard about it before. That's, yeah, right. um, and since then, well, obviously since then, I've been really you know stimulated to know an awful lot more. And in fact, they've written, compiled a really lovely book about the camp, full of pictures and stories and letters. And you know, that's available free if anybody's interested from the library in Oldcastle. Um, but you know, to be honest, when I read it first myself. I thought I wouldn't be able to do this because I thought I would just blabber my way through it, you know. Um, I just feel quite emotional, you know, in terms of the discovery of the reconnection with that, you know, that story. Mm -hmm. isn't, it, isn't it amazing, though, that you drew a connection that wasn't previously there with your grandfather mm. through that, that story? Yeah, oh, totally. Events? Totally. And, you know, when I was on, in Oldcastle on that day, I really did try to, or, well, not try to, I just saw through his eyes, you know, for the first time and really got in touch with just how enormous it was, you know, so. Yeah, yeah it's also, it's a wonderful tribute also to the people of that, that time that they still can honour it 100 years it, on. It is amazing. I mean, that day just, you know, as I described it, you know, they were all out dressed up and, you know, and everybody involved, men, women and children in the town. As I say, they've no ambivalence about owning it as part of their history, which is fantastic. It's brilliant. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you so much. Um, so okay. glad you got in touch with that story. As, as I say, that, that is amazing. <laughs>